Many witches know the sign that the moon was born. The, sorry, many witches know the sign that the moon was in on the day that they were born. But do you know what phase it was in on your birth date? Now, there are some people who believe that the different phases of the moon will actually color the personalities of those who were born under that sphere of influence. And not only that, but there are people who feel more creative each cycle when the moon is in the same phase as it was when they were born, almost like a personal power day each cycle. So what phase was the moon in when you were born? If you don't know, that's okay. Don't worry because we're going to be talking about all that and more in tonight's episode. So Mary Meet, I'm Aislin. This is Ask Aislin, and I'm here tonight talking about the lunar phase of your birth date. All right, so just saying hi to those who are, who are joining us live. Hi, everybody. So if you are with us live, definitely put questions, comments in the chat. I will be answering those as we go. So we're going to dive in. I'm going to tell you a little bit about why the phase of your birth date is important. And then we'll talk about how you can figure it out and then what that means about you. Okay. So as witches, we are always aware of that impact that the moon has on us. There's a buildup of energy from the new moon to the full moon, and then there's a dissipation of that same energy from the full moon back down to the dark moon. And then, of course, during that time, the releasing and the letting go that many of us feel, and then that rebirth at the next new moon that opens up the opportunities for what the next cycle will bring. So now we know that these lunar energies change us. They affect us in different ways. And, um, and it's maybe true that the lunar phase that the moon was in when we were born also affects us as well. So I'm going to start off with an interesting story that I read about a Czech, um, a Czech obstetrician who was doing studies with his patients and found that the women in his study, or I guess the patients in his study, when he was studying their menstrual cycles, he found that they had a peak fertility, not just on the day of their ovulation, but also, strangely, on the day that corresponded to the phase of the moon when they were born. And so he also found this to a lesser degree in his male patients, or I suppose he was studying fertility, so he was probably in the, in the male partners of these patients. But it's a very fascinating thing to think about because it is true that if it's true, what this means is that we actually have this point in the cycle when we have higher energy for us individually. And this is about more than just fertility. It's about anything that is applied to our creative ventures. So for example, I was born during the waxing crescent moon just hours before the moon had changed into the first quarter. And every month I track the moon cycle and I track my energy and I track my emotions and, um, and when it gets to this point, when we get to this, this last day of the waxing crescent before it moves into the first quarter, I always find that I have this extra burst of creative energy. And so if, um, if you need to breathe some kind of life into creative ventures or projects or different things that you're working on, you might want to consider tracking your own lunar energy and seeing if this works for you. Figure out what the lunar phase was when you were born and then pay attention to that phase every time we reach it in each additional cycle. And what you might find is you have this burst of energy, creative energy, and when you know about that, you can utilize it. Otherwise, you don't know about it, right? So maybe you might feel creative on a certain day and you get a lot of things done, but you don't know when that's going to come, right? And so you can't prepare for it. But the beauty of this is that if we track this, we can actually prepare for that day. And if you know you got to get something done, that's the day to do it on. Okay, so if you don't already know the phase that the moon was in on your birth date, I am going to put a link in the chat. And uh, let me see if I can do this right now while we are live. For those who are live, anybody who's watching back in replay, this will be easy for you to go back in and get this. But... The strange thing is I am not, I'm not able to, uh, there we go. I can see my comments right now. Okay. So I'm dropping this in the chat for those live. So I really like this particular website because many of the websites you go to are going to show you the phase of the moon on the, on any particular date, but you're not going to know what time zone that is in. So 
if I look this up in certain places, mine will sometimes say first quarter and then mine will sometimes say waxing crescent. This particular site that I just dropped in the chat and anybody watching in replay, you'll find it right below the video, will actually allow you to put in the zip code where you were born and then it will calculate this to exactly your location. Okay, so anybody who doesn't know, check that out there. And I'm just pausing to say hi to some people. I see Colleen is here and Sonia. Misty said she was born in a waning moon. So she, what she's gonna wanna do is drop, you're gonna wanna drop your birth date and your birth zip code into that app or into that website. So you can find out more about just waning moon because we wanna know if it's waning crescent, waning gibbous or last quarter. And then saying hi to Kurt is here. Hi, Kurt. And Amy's here. And Cindy. Merry meet, everybody. Okay. So once you figure out the phase that your um, birthday, the phase of the moon when you were born, you will be able to calculate your personal kind of power date or power com couple of days every cycle. But what we're gonna do now is we're also gonna look at how that colors your personality. So we're gonna go through the different phases of the moon. I'm gonna talk about what each one means about the, per the people that were born underneath them and you can see if that resonates with you. Okay, so we're gonna go ahead and start with the new moon. Now the new moon is the first to second day of the lunar cycle. This is, uh, for those who are interested in kind of like the astronomical or ast astronomical math behind it, this is zero to 45 degrees uh, angle from the sun. Now people who are born during the new moon, we gotta kind of think about what new moon, what the new moon is like, right? So when the new moon is in the sky, we don't really see it at all and it's covered, it's blocked, right? So this is gonna explain something about these babies are born in, in the darkness of having no moon there. So these people tend to be creative and adventurous, but every, every one of these phases kind of has some negative sides to it or some less than positive sides. These people also can be kind of impulsive sometimes. Now, like I said, these are babies who were born when there was no moonlight at all. And so they had to learn to listen to their instincts. So we kind of think about the moon as being, it guides our emotions, it guides our instinctual um, feelings within the body. And so when we don't have that moon there to track us, we have to go inside internally. And so people who are born under a new moon often are, are, have a very strong intuition because of this. Now they also tend to embrace new opportunities and new experiences, because think about it, it's the new moon, it's the beginning of the cycle. But sometimes these people have a little trouble following through, which also makes a lot of sense with that lunar energy. The new moon is kind of energy where, right, everything's reborn back into the light. It's the start of the new cycle, but the energy's a little stagnant. So it can be hard to get things going the way we might see in some of these people born in the signs a little, little bit later, I shouldn't say signs, the phases a little bit later in the cycle. Now, people who are born under a new moon often will need long, longer periods of renewal. So everybody has kind of that cycle where, where we, sometimes we feel like we want to go internally, we draw back, we're feeling less social, but people born under a new moon might feel that to a greater degree. And for that reason, anybody born under a new moon should really watch that, right? And make sure that you're taking time to pause and retreat when you need to and not just pushing through, um, okay? All right, so let's go on to the next phase. So I'm just doing them in order. So the next one would be the waxing crescent. Now the waxing crescent is found on days three to six. And I see that um, there's, let's see, I see people were putting all of their phases in here. Cool. Okay. So you guys will be, as we go through, you'll be able to see whether uh, or not this tracks for you. Okay. So those with the waxing crescent, this is days three to six of the lunar cycle. And the, the calculation is 45 degrees to 90 degrees angle from the sun. Now people born under the waxing crescent, and this includes me, these people tend to be, have a, a natural positivity, I don't know that I always have that, but I try to stay, I try to stay positive. These people also have faith even in dark and troubled times. So these are kind of people who the, the faith is a bit unwavering for them. They tend to be ambitious and productive, right? Because this is the energy in the beginning of the cycle when things are really starting to move, but these people may be a little adverse to risks. So maybe they don't like to take risks as much. 
They tend to charge ahead though with focused energy and curiosity because that's kind of the ambitious um, nature of the waxing crescent. And they tend to be loyal and have a strong sense of justice. Uh, productive in some such way that many people may look at them and admire them and kind of wonder how do these people do everything that they're able to do through their willpower and determination. And that's usually how they do it. They will stop at nothing to succeed at what they want to accomplish. But what they really need to do is learn how to trust their intuition. So think about the people at the new moon. They come in with this inherent sense of intuition. People at the, at the waxing crescent have that intuition, but sometimes second guess it. And so that can be a lot of their work here. Okay, so that is the waxing crescent moon. Okay, so for those who are waxing crescents, if you're here live, you can put in the chat if any of that resonates with you. I know for me, I, I think a lot of that resonates. I, I've always been told I have a lot of willpower. I'm able to do things that other people sometimes aren't able to do because I just push through it. Sometimes that can be a good thing. Sometimes that can be a um, not so good thing, right, too, when we forget that we need to rest. But I definitely know that learning to trust my intuition has been a big part of my journey. All right, so let's move on to the first quarter moon. So the first quarter moon takes place on days seven to eight of the cycle. This is at 90 to 135 degrees angle from the sun. This is the moon sun square. So when we get to both of these points, we get to the first quarter and the last quarter. These are points of tension in the lunar cycle because of the square that the moon is making to the sun. Now squares in astrology tend to be tense. In, in more ancient astrology, these were very, these were oftentimes feared aspects, but in more modern astrology, we don't fear them. We just look at them as being challenges that lead us to growth. Now people who are born at the first quarter, they may feel that they are at like an ongoing crisis point, which means that there's just a lot of things that happen that are there that are kind of put them in a chaos or crisis and then they get resolved and they find later that they've transformed by it. Everybody feels those points, but these people at the first quarter tend to have more of these in their lives. They may feel, just simply feel this natural tension of the cycle, but this keeps them motivated and determined. And that's the beauty of the hard aspects of, of astrology is that if we had all soft, harmonious aspects, we would do nothing. But when we have these harder aspects, they force us to change. Now, people born at the first quarter are capable, action-oriented, but also can be impatient because they're sort of at that point in the lunar cycle where like, where are we? We're, we're starting to begin to grow. We're like halfway between the new and the full moon. So there's kind of this impatience, like, come on, let's get going already. People born at the first quarter might feel that they have like one foot in the past and one foot in the future. And they're sort of straddling that line. And so they're likely going to be confronted by a lot of choices throughout their life. And one of the things that they want to learn how to do is trust their intuition. But to, ad to like add to that, trust their intuition in the decisions that they have to make and become more decisive so they don't waver so much when it's time to make a choice. Okay. Um, Okay, so Amy, and I've seen Amy in the chat, and she said she Googled it, and one site says wax and gibbous, and another says full moon. Okay, so the reason that's saying that is because one is using a different time zone than the other. So what I recommend doing is find in the chat where I put the link there, and that will let you put the zip code of your birth, and then you're going to have this very accurate. Because for me, too, I, if I do it one place, it says first quarter. And if I do it the other place, it says waxing crescent. That just means that you're in the middle of the two. But we need to know which, which one it is for your actual birth date or your actual, your actual zip code. Okay, so wa uh, let, going on next to the waxing gibbous. Okay, so this would be the final sign of the waxing side of the moon, and then we'll cross over into full moon. Now, during the waxing gibbous, this is days 9 to 13, the sun and moon make a 135 to 180 degree angle. Now people born during this phase, waxing gibbous, tend to be calm and nurturing. These are people that we go to for nurturance. We, we know these are the people that we wanna go to when um, we need a listening ear perhaps, or somebody who's gonna help, help us. These people also tend to be perfectionistic. So that's gonna be something they're gonna wanna, um, gonna wanna look for. 
Uh, so this phase encourages our individual development and our growth. And people born during the waxing gibbous may develop many different skills throughout their lives, sometimes through finding mentors, different people who are going to teach them different things and absorbing all of that in. Now, people born at the waxing gibbous tend to be deeply introspective. And like I said, very calm. They, they may have a calm demeanor in themselves, but they're also calming. Their presence is calming. So people like to be around them and people often will look to them for support. So for those people who are, who are born at the waxing gibbous, it, their challenge and their kind of work is to be that support person, but also not give everything away, right? Learning how to make sure that that part is balanced. Um, okay, so let me go to the next one. And I see that Amy said it didn't go back to her year. Oh, that's strange. It should go way far back. It should go way far back, but I'll look at it in a second. All right, the, uh, the full moon is, takes place at days 14 to 15. This is 180 degrees to 225 degrees from uh, the sun and uh, sun and moon angle. Now, people born at the full moon tend to be more emotional and sensitive than others, but also can be conflicted. So conflicting emotions, right? Maybe conflicting feelings inside of them. They tend to be relationship oriented. The moon is all about our relationships and they learn most through exploring and examining their relationships through being in relationships. So this doesn't mean just romantic. This means all of the platonic relationships they have, all the familial relationships they have, any relationship they have, they tend to learn a lot about themselves and transform themselves through these relationships. People born at the full moon may feel that they get, like they have two opposite sides to their personality. And, um, and you know, that simply has to do with sort of, the, sort of their poised right in the middle between the waxing and the waning halves of the cycle. Now, they may be drawn to people from many different spheres of, lives, of life. So these may be people who have a lot of friends who are very different than them um, and very different from each other. They tend to be very unique, have a very magnetic personality that just draws people in. People want to be their friends. And, but at the same time, they may be more indecisive than other people and also may tend to be emotional. Now, their real challenge here is learning how their emotions and that fact that they're so emotional can become a superpower for them. Because we know that being emotional is a very positive thing, right? It makes us empathic, it makes us more sensitive, but at the same time, being too emotional in places can be, be um, not as positive, right? So we wanna learn how to balance our emotions but, and then learn how they can become a superpower. Okay, so Mary Meet, I see a few others joining. Um, I see Colleen said she's a waning crescent. We're gonna get to that one. Sabrina's here, Mary Meet. Okay, so moving on, now we start to move into the waning half. So the first sign here is the wane, or not sign, the first phase here is the waning gibbous. So this takes place on days 16 to 21, and it takes, it's found at 225 to 270 degrees angle sun to moon. People born at the waning gibbous tend to be positive and analytical, but may also be critical. So that would be the more negative side we want to watch out for. Now, people born at the waning gibbous enjoy sharing their life lessons and experiences with others. And so other people want to be near them because they want to learn from them. They want to learn th through their experiences, right? But the people who are born at the waning gibbous also have that desire and that need to tell their story so that others can learn from it. They can be good teachers. So many of them will be, maybe they're not teachers professionally, but they're good at teaching things. They're also usually innately self-aware and gracious. So they have this just innate gratitude for things around them, which means whenever we have innate gratitude, it usually means that the, it attracts things from the universe. So people born at the waning gibbous might find that they are gifted with extra good luck or opportunities. Maybe opportunities seem to just find them. People born at the waning gibbous can sometimes be misjudged as a know-it-all. So their real work here is to be, uh, to be open and listen to other people. So they're, because right, they have such experiences that everybody wants to listen to them, but 
people may sense that they're, may perceive them to be know-it-alls because they don't know them well enough. And um, so these people need to really listen to other people and, and get to know what they have to say too. And they also may find, this is kind of interesting, people born at the waning gibbous, and this really goes for everybody born in the waning half of the cycle, sometimes find it easier to let go of things than other people, right? Because they're already, they're born in the half of the cycle where we're letting go of stuff. And so they may find that easier than other people. Okay, moving to the last quarter moon, sometimes called third quarter. This is days 22 through 23 of the cycle, and it's found at 270 degrees to 315 degrees um, angle between sun and moon. People born at the last quarter tend to be loyal and sentimental, but also can be um, get, get kind of attached, okay? So they might find it difficult to let go this is what's kind of interesting. This is what's kind of interesting. At this point, it can be a little bit difficult to let go. So they'll get a kind of attached to things because we're moving, we're kind of tipping further into the waning half of that cycle, but we're poised at that spot, right? Where there's half the moon is illuminated, half is in shadows. And it can be a sort of disconcerting place to be. So remember I talked about at the first quarter, there's sort of this tension. There's also a tension at the last quarter. And that doesn't mean anything bad if you're born at the last quarter of the first quarter. It just means we have to be aware of some kind of inherent tension that might pop up. Now, the journey of a person born at the last quarter uh, may lead them to shed um, like basically shed everything that they know and set off in a new direction. So these are people who might find that they're constantly like reinventing themselves. And there may be a turning point later in their lives where they just kind of do a 180 and they just shift to a new personality or a new perspective. Maybe they meet somebody or have some kind of an experience that just radically alters everything about them and it just sets them off on a completely different path. They may outgrow the people and the places um, and the environments around them quicker than others. And so what they have to watch out for is sort of that, um, th that kind of dichotomy between these two energies, like getting attached to things versus letting go of things. And they may find that they get let go of things quicker, some things, but they feel more attached to other things. Now, closure is a really important part of, the, of anybody born at the last quarter because they really need to learn how to find it. It's because what, what it means, I think, this is what I, how I would interpret this, is that it's easy, it's kind of easy to shed things when you're born at the last quarter, it's kind of easy to let go, but perhaps not have closure, right? So there's still some kind of an attachment to it, but we have to learn how to fully let go and kind of release ourselves from it. And so what that means is people born at the last quarter may find that they need long periods of reflection to work through that and let things go completely. Okay, and then finally, this brings us to the final part of the lunar cycle. This is the waning crescent. So people born at the waning crescent, this is days 24 to the end of the cycle. This includes the dark moon and the balsamic moon. That's all packaged up in the waning crescent. 315 degrees to 360 degrees angle with the sun as we move back to the new moon. People born at the last, um, sorry, at the waning crescent tend to be more imaginative and unconventional than other people. So these are like people who have maybe are, are inventors. Some of them might be inventors, have kind of those aha moments, kind of pull things out of the ether, like think ideas, right? But they, these people also may feel kind of isolated because of their more unconventional way of living or, or their more unconventional mind. Now, they have a strong pull towards endings throughout their life because this is the end of the lunar cycle. There's periods of emotional heaviness that they may feel, and it may feel to them that they need to kind of clear their path out frequently uh, for them to get a fresh start, right? That's the promise of the new moon. This is a very spiritual placement. So those born at the waning crescent may find that they're very attracted to spirituality. They tend to have more resilience than others and a strong intuition. And they also tend to enjoy solitude, almost like they're a psychic sponge. So they're just picking up a lot of energy, psychic energy around them. And so therefore they kind of need the solitude. So they're not always picking that up. Now, people born at the waning crescent may underestimate the gifts 
um, their gifts more than they realize. And so what they really need to do is pay extra attention to grounding themselves. They can feel a little bit ungrounded at times. And um, they tend to be perceived as quite wise. This is the end of the lunar cycle. So it's sort of like in the solar cycle, we say that people who are born in Pisces tend to be the tend to be the wiser ones, the ones who are really connected to their in intuition. And so we can say something kind of similar to those born at the waning crescent. Okay, so what you wanna do is you wanna look up uh, the, play, the phase that your moon was in, and you can use the link I put in the chat, and then I'm gonna go check it to, to make sure how many um, years it goes back. So once you figure out where your moon was when you were born, so what phase it was in, afterwards, you know, let me know if you're watching this back in replay, let me know if this resonates with you. If you're here live, I see some of you saying, yes, it resonates with you. But also I would recommend consider tracking your energy and your emotions um, each cycle. So we were especially at that phase, right? So what I would do is I would, if I know that I'm born, I'm born waxing crescent, I want to pay attention to every cycle when the moon is in the waxing crescent. I want to see how I feel. And I want to track that over several cycles because if I just look at it at one cycle, I could be having an off cycle. But if I track it for three or four or five cycles and I start to see a pattern, then I'm going to know that there's something to this. And so you may find that it is your personal power day. You may find that you are more creative during that time like I do. I find every time we get to the, uh, to the, um, the waxing uh, crescent, I feel a lot of energy. And I know that there's gonna be a time in the cycle where I wanna be able to get a lot done. So see how you, see, see what you think about that. I'd love to hear from you. Do you feel more energetic when the moon is in the phase it was in when you were born? Okay, so I'm gonna shift into the Q&A, but before I do that, I am going to go and look at this um, thing I sent you guys. Okay, so I'm just going to see if this, this should go back. I can get this to go back to, I put it back to like, let's see. I can get it go all the way back to 1950. So I think it goes back to as far as you want it to go. You put in your zip code and then you'll put in your month and then you just put in your year. I can get it to go back to 1940. Um, I think I can get it going back further. Okay, so try that. And this is a good one to use because it, um, it allows you to put in the zip code. And like I had said earlier, if you try to use other sites, you may find you get a different answer if you're born near the kind of cusp between the two phases, because some of them are going to be measured in universal time. And then some of them are measured in who knows time in the United States, but um, I would definitely use this site I gave you because it allows you to put in the zip code. But anybody having trouble with it, let me know. Hopefully you can find yours on here. I see that Adam said he's not seeing comments. You know what's weird is I wasn't seeing comments before either. And I don't know about your screen, but on mine, there's like a button to refresh it. And then all of a sudden I can see the comments. Um, Colleen said her time, uh, for the cycle is coming soon. So she's going to pay attention to it. Yeah, exactly. Um, Sabrina said she finds that she watches the moon often and she feels drawn to the waxing crescent. So basically she's feeling the energy and it draws, um, her. Yeah. Do you, Sabrina, do you know what, um, phase the moon was in when you were born? If you were, cause you were born in the waxing crescent, that would make a lot of sense. Sonia said she can't see the comments either. I, I don't know. There's been a couple of times that I was live on here and literally what it'll show me is there's no viewers at all. No one's watching this at all, but even though I know there are, it'll show no comments and then I keep refreshing it. And then all of a sudden I can see it all here. I'm just going to say this too. We're like, let's see, we're four days away from Mercury retrograde and I've already been seeing a lot of tech stuff happening. <laughs> so it may just be me. But uh, I think there's going to be some tech mishaps happening as we move further clo and get closer to Mercury retrograde. All right, so I'm going to move into the Q&A right now. Anybody live, you can add questions here. I've got a couple to answer today, but I'd, I'll take anybody's questions. So, um, so this first question comes from Ruth, and she said, 
uh, she's got a very good question here. So Ruth said, I'm curious about soul contracts. Do we choose to lose loved ones? And she says, for example, children before coming here, what lesson could we possibly learn from this experience? And then she said, someone recently told me that my soul contract had agreed upon this before I was born and, and she had lost her daughter. And then she said, there are things in my life I think are agreed upon, but this one I can't fathom. Okay, so I have, um, I've done a lot of studying about soul contracts. So I have a lot of things to say about this one. So, I mean, the first thing I'm going to say is it's never easy to lose a child and it's, it's never easy to understand why either. So just know that that is natural that, um, for that. Okay. So, um, as far as soul contracts go, I do believe that, um, based on my own insights that I have gained through working with mine, through doing kind of meditative journeying and through things that I've read, I do believe that we agree to things before we're born. Now, what could we possibly learn from the experience of losing a child? We could ask the same question, like what could we possibly learn from any negative experience, right? And the answer is going to be different for everybody. And it's often not going to be immediately known. Okay, so when the losses are fresh, and by this, I can even, this can be years. It can take years for us to consider the loss not fresh anymore or consider us, ourselves even in a place where we could begin to contemplate, you know, what the message could be or what, what the thing is that we were supposed to learn. Um, so here's a few thoughts on it. We work through karma during all of our lived experiences. So that's through um, anything that challenges us. We're we're constantly working through karma and it doesn't mean that we did something bad. So that's always a question. I, I get asked that a lot, like negative things are happening to me. Does that mean I have bad karma? Now, negative karma, what we might call, you know, bad karma isn't really what people think. It's not a punishment for something that we did. That is a um, Judeo Christian idea that we're like constantly being punished for sins and things that, um, you know, we've done. Negative karma is about lessons that have not been completed. And so when people carry what they perceive to be as negative karma through their incarnations, it's nothing that they, it's not like they're doing bad things that they're paying for. It's that they are, perhaps they haven't learned a lesson in a previous life, or perhaps the lesson that they have to learn takes more than one lifetime. And that is actually quite, quite normal. Now, when we incarnate into the earth school, like people call, will call it, there's some people who say this is the hardest school to be incarnated into. I don't know. I don't know if I've been incarnated into other schools. I know I've been incarnated into this one, but um, we come here to experience certain things that are going to aid us in our growth. And our soul contract is that prior to our birth, we choose the experiences that will do that, that will aid us in the type of soul development that we want. Now, I believe, and this is through my own kind of journeying, is that when we make these decisions, we, it's not that this is, these are faded, like preordained moments. It's that we make some choices about like, what are the things that could lead us to the development that, development that we want? And some of those occur and some of those don't. And there's also choices within the pathway that will actually kind of lead us to one or another of those possibilities. So it's not like we just set out on a preordained path and there's like nothing we can do about it. Um, so not all of those things will happen. Some of them will. And, and one of the issues is, is that our higher self, which is the one that chooses all of this, some would call this our soul. This is the part of us that's that's there that exists beyond the incarnation into this body this part of us has the great wisdom it knows exactly what those lessons are it knows exactly why we're here but unfortunately we lose access to most of that when we incarnate now probably the reason for that is because it would be too easy for us to complete our lessons if we knew that and if we had access to that it's kind of like think about like if you had the scantron to the answers to a test it's not like You've, you've got a, you got an A plus on it, right? But you knew all the answers. So if we come in already knowing what we're supposed to do, there's no real work to be done here. So what happens is we kind of forget all of this. We get access to it through different things like meditative practices, shadow work, 
journeying, we can gain insight into what that path is, what the things are that we need to learn from our experiences, but, um, but we don't gain full access to that. Now, I'm going to just share briefly a bit of something that I learned. So I had an ectopic pregnancy. Some, of, some people know that who follow me. And in the moment that I had this, after trying for years and years and years, it was very hard to fathom. Why would I, why would I choose this? Like, why would I choose this event, right? But the experience forced me into my shadow work in order to heal myself emotionally. This group and my Shadow Seekers membership literally is born out of the work that I did. So without that, you know, now there are hundreds of people, there's 3,500 people in this group. So there's hundreds of people every week who are, you know, watching these videos or looking at the content they are getting helped because of it, right? So we just never, never know where those experiences go, what they lead to, you know, why they're here, why they were chosen, right? I certainly had no access to that during the moments I was having the, you know, I was losing that ectopic pregnancy. I nearly lost my life in the, in the process as well. And uh, how would I have any, any knowledge of that, right? But now I can look back and I reflect and I see, wow, there was something that came of it. Now, I also read a lot afterwards about what happens, um, you know, when we lose a pregnancy. So I'm going to like speak from this experience of my own, the spiritual aspects of losing a pregnancy are also related to um, the loss of children, so children who were born and then are lost later. In many cases, the losses are meant to kind of burn off karma that is carried between the two people. Now, the other thing that we also need to remember whenever we ask about the loss of another person is that there's another person involved and they have their own karma and they have their own lessons to work through. So there are some that say that we even, we choose to sort of exit the world at a pre-decided time when our work here is complete in this incarnation. And so some stay briefly, some stay longer, and we don't know when we're here in this incarnation, we don't know any of that. Um, but we're left behind. Those of us who are left behind, we're left behind in all this great pain. But the transition from spirit, from you know, the earthly world back into the spirit world is actually a celebratory one for those who are crossing over. Um, now, I believe that we, we all, those of us left behind in loss and those of us struggling with negative things and we can't figure out why um, and what meaning we should gain from them, I believe that we will eventually find that meaning over time but it does take time. We got to be patient and just be as gentle as you can be with yourself until you find it. But that would be my, um, my kind of sharing my thoughts on soul contract. Um, but I do believe that we, you know, we, we choose some of these experiences while we come in, when, before we come in and when we're in them, it's, it's hard to imagine, oh my God, why would I ever choose that? Right? Why, why would I ever choose to live this way? But, um, hopefully we gain that insight later. And I, and I know I certainly did. And I know I certainly in those moments could not fathom it either, but I have through what has happened to me afterwards and through these, the five years since have gained that insight. So I hope that helps, um, but never easy to lose a child. And it brings up so many, so many questions for us. Okay. Um, so let me go to the next question. So this was, this is a very quick question and, um, I already answered her on in, in where she left the question, but I'm going to share it anyway for anybody who's wondering, Amy asked, is there a book for clearing and energizing chakras? She said, I've watched the videos that you make, but I've, uh, I need a written copy of something to go back to, uh, reference. Okay. So I get it. I'm a big fan of books as well. So my number one recommendation, I always recommend it. This is Wheels of Life by Anna Dia Judith. She is probably considered the number one expert on the chakra system in the West. There's a lot of books you can buy from writers in the East, but this book is very, very accessible. And it goes, she, in fact, this is called the user's guide to the chakra system. So it takes you through every chakra. It gives you exercises. It gives you background on the chakras. And um, it will, like you said, how do I balance, how do I clear them and energize them? This book will tell you how to do that. Okay, Wheels of Life, Anadia Judith. All right, next question is from Kurt. Let me find it here. Okay, so Kurt said, how does, he has actually several questions, so I'm going to answer um, each of these. So he said, how does aligning your chakras help with improving depression 
And then he kind of added on witchcraft and Reiki share some of the same aspects, and he's working, he said, I'm working on that. Okay, so let me answer that one first, and then he has another question. So the first thing I would say is misaligned chakras are always going to restrict our energy flow, so they're going to kind of knock us out in different ways, whether that's physical or emotional, it's just going to bring us out, out from center, right? So when we align the chakras, we bring them all back into balance, and that improves the various ailments of the body and the mind, including depression. Now you're right, there are a lot, of, a lot of similarities between the way we manipulate energy in witchcraft and the way that we manipulate energy in Reiki. They just have different um, uh, destinations for where the energy goes. So a lot like in witchcraft, when we're raising energy, usually that energy is being projected outward, maybe into a spell or a magical working, or we're drawing in energy from the earth, different things like that. In Reiki, of course, we're transmitting energy maybe to ourselves or to someone else, either locally or in a, at a distance. But I agree with you. When I got my Reiki one, I remember being like, I'm already doing this. I already, I've already been moving energy like this my entire life. And so um, I agree. I think there's a very great similarity between it. And I think witches who train themselves in Reiki, I think that actually can improve their witchcraft as well. Now, um, the second question he said, he said he could feel energy from the earth, the moon, the planets. But he says, what about other parts of the universe? Like black holes. He said, I've always been drawn to them. Stars, comets, comet, comets and other objects in the universe. He said, I think about this universal energy. Okay, so I think this is a great question. So I do believe that we can connect to other energies in the universe. Um, where did I write the rest of the answer here? And to the planets. Okay, so we generally will say, we'll generally say that we are less influenced by bodies that are further away from us than those that are closer to us. So this is like in astrology, right? So let's think about the difference between your sun sign and your the sign that Pluto is in. Most people don't pay attention to the sign that Pluto is in, but everybody knows their sun sign, right? So we're most influenced by the sun, the moon, the ascendant, um, Mercury and Venus and Mars. We might even say Saturn and Jupiter. But as we start to get further out, the energies of Uranus and Neptune and Pluto tend to be more peripheral energies. They can accentuate what's going on in the chart, but they also um, they tend to be more global. So for, for what, by what I mean by that is that people who are born within like a span of several years will all have the same Pluto. And so what that does is it brings in like sort of like a, um, a collective energy. So like all the people born in this decade have kind of a similar feel or there's a, a certain theme that those people's lives might revolve around um, or it might color the, the lives that they live. Now, with stars and black holes, uh, being so far away, some people might say that you're not influenced by those at all, but you say that you feel connected to them, and I agree. I think they can influence us because if we think about quantum physics and we think about matter, right, like really small amounts of matter like atoms, quarks, and even prions, which are smaller than quarks, we, uh, they behave differently when they're observed. So there is so much that we don't understand about physics, if you just like study physics, classical physics, and you look at quantum physics, these are two totally different branches of science. Now, we can, um, we can understand where something is, we can understand its position, as we know where something is located. When we come down to the subatomic level, we can know where something's located, but we can't understand its momentum. We, and we can understand its momentum, but we can't know where it's located. So there's always this uncertainty when we're at that subatomic level. And that's where things get so interesting, right? Classical physics rules like kind of the outwardly big movements that we can see, but quantum physics rules something completely different. And I think, I've always felt this, that the reason why we can't scientifically prove the magic that we as witches say exists or the things that we say we're doing or we're seeing or we're experiencing is because science just simply has not caught up to that yet, doesn't have the tools to measure it, but quantum physics is likely to be the pathway for that. So where am I going with all of this is at that very subatomic level. Theoretically, 
a quark or a prion or some very, very small, small particle inside of you can be inside of you in one instant and can be halfway across the universe in another instant and then it can be back to you. And um, what this means is that I don't understand why we couldn't feel connected to things that are very far away because of just the way that matter is shifting and, the, um, and how we don't quite understand it all. Now, one thing that I recommend is anybody who's really interested in that kind of like connection between science and magic might want to check out this book. This is called Science, uh, The Science of the Craft. This is by William H. Keith. It's very dense. It's a science book. Don't get it if you don't like science. But if you like science, this book goes into quantum physics, how um, basically all these things I was just saying, it, it comes from this book and um, incredible book. So I would check that out if you're interested in science. But I, I agree with Kurt. I think you absolutely can connect to um, parts of the universe that are much further away from us. Okay, and then um, speaking of energy, Kim had said, what is energy manipulation? She said, what does it mean? How do you do it? She said, I find this fascinating. So when people are talking about energy manipulation, they just simply mean that they're moving energy. So we can manipulate energy inside of the body. That's what working with the chakra system is. We can manipulate energy from outside of the body into the body. So when we ground and we draw in energy, like let's say we drop our roots down into the ground, um, you know, in our mind's eye, and we begin to pull up earth energy into the body, right? That's manipulating energy. If we, if we take energy from inside of us and we send it outside of us, let's say we charge a talisman or an object or we're doing Reiki, this is manipulating energy as well, coming from inside to outside. So there's easy ways to feel the manipulation of energy. So one thing is you take the nail beds of your hands, of your fingers, and you just rub them together vigorously like this. And you have to do this for a while. So you can't really do it for like five seconds or 10 seconds. So I'm, I'm, I'm talking like a minute and you just want to do this. If you have nail polish on, may, maybe you don't want to do it, but if you don't care, we're doing this. And so we're doing this because I want you to feel this in a second. And te people tend to feel this more than they do when they um, just rub their hands together. Okay. So then most people, when they stop, you're going to feel this tingling in your hands, and that is the energy that you have raised. Now, that could be directed into an object to be charged, and that is manipulating energy. That's taking energy from inside me. I raised it myself inside my own body, and then I directed it out towards somebody or something. Now, you can also do exercises where you send energy to other people, like through Reiki, right? But there's also the pushing and pulling energy exercise where you have, you need a partner for this, but you would get them to stand across the room and then you practice, um, close your eyes and they close their eyes and you practice sending energy like you're trying to like energetically push them. And if you try this, many people will find that the receiver, even if they try not to have this happen, the receiver will at some point just feel like they're just like invisibly being pushed back. <laughs> and the, um, and in the, 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 the sender may not feel much, but the receiver can feel it for sure. And then you can switch and then you can try to be the receiver and let that person send to you. But that's another way to, to manipulate energy. And then like I also mentioned working with the chakras. So one thing you can do is do some stimulating breath work. So like, for example, the breath of fire or uh, like a panting breath. So breath of fire is like, like you're fogging up a mirror and then you close your mouth. There's like a staccato um, exhale in the belly, right? And you do that, raise that energy for like a minute or so. And then what I like to do is really pull the energy kind of up from the base of your spine, which would be your root chakra, and see if you can move it through your body. If you practice this a lot, you'll actually feel it. It's like um, a different sensation. I don't, I, I don't know how to explain it. It kind of feels like liquid to me. Everybody's gonna feel it differently, but you pull the energy up from the root of the spine, practice pulling it up into the solar plexus, practice pulling it up into the heart. You can practice pulling it all the way up into the third eye. You can leave it there and then send it back down or you can send it out into the universe, like project it out from your third eye. But this, when, when people talk about manipulating energy, I think this is what you're asking about. If it's not, you can um, let me know if there's something more I should add to the answer. But, um, but that's how 
that's what we mean by it is just learning how to um, get really good at moving energy and usually what will happen is people are drawn to witchcraft and they'll do this a little bit in their rituals they'll raise some energy move some energy they'll feel it but if you practice it daily with breath work or working with your chakras you get really good at it and then and then you can do more with it okay so i hope that helps let me see what's in the chat here um let's see here merry meet to everybody uh, misty said it's funny because it says the people like it sounds like people who uh have waning gibbous are rebellious and she said it sounds like me um okay I hope people can see okay some people can't see the link you'll probably maybe you'll see it once we end the video hopefully you guys can see it okay can you post the name in the comments which one do you want the name of one of the books I'm gonna assume Sabrina said let me know and I'll put the name in the comments for sure which one do you want Kurt said I learned a lot from all of the all of these depression therapy Reiki or aligning the chakras with aligning the chakras yeah exactly you're gonna learn a lot about like where depression comes from why you have it and how to let go of it okay the science one okay hopefully you guys will see this if not you may see it when the video is over it's called the science of the craft by and his name is William H Keith so like I said uh, a dense book but for those who like science, you'll really enjoy it. Okay, any other questions? I'm going to tell you guys what's coming up next. If, but if anybody has any other questions, put them in the chat. I have the feeling I'm not seeing all of the comments either. I think we're having major issues with the comments today. So if I miss anybody's, I will catch those later after the video is over. Okay, next week, what is coming up? So on 4-3 next Wednesday, there's going to be no episode of Ask Aislinn. I'm taking the week off. I um, encourage people to take off time when they need to, especially if they work a lot and they're in like a giving, helping profession. So I just need the week off. I'm taking it off from, not from Body, Mind, Witchcraft, but I'm taking it off from my muggle job. And, but that also means I'm just not going to do an Ask Aislinn. But on 4-5, Friday, next Friday, April 5th, my birthday was last yesterday as some of you know and i really thank everybody for all the comments it's it's quite like overwhelming in a good way there's like hundreds of them <laughs> so i'm getting back to thanking everybody thank you all so much for the birthday wishes um, but i am going to be doing a birthday concert next um, april um, the 5th friday april the 5th i'm going to be playing songs from the various bands i've been in over the years as well as some of my solo music and some of my spiritual music everybody's invited there's going to be a zoom link that's going to be in the group in the body mind witchcraft group and in our shadow seekers group i'd love for people to come live on zoom but there will be a replay afterwards as well if anybody wants to come okay so that will kind of make up for my um, missed episode next week and then on 4 10 the following wednesday i'll be back talking about the fire element all right, so I don't see any other comments. I'm going to try to refresh them once to make sure there's nothing I've missed. Um, it looks like I haven't missed anything. Okay, so I am going to sign off for tonight. But if you guys, if I miss anything, I'll go back and catch it later. For anybody who's watching this, uh, make sure to put a thumbs up or a heart somewhere. It just helps us get this in the feed of others. And if you're watching back in um, later in replay on YouTube, make sure to subscribe to the channel body mind witchcraft you won't miss any of our future episodes all right well happy um happy wednesday and i hope you have a wonderful rest of your night oh one more question here before we go sonia said what does it mean if someone says they feel like they weren't supposed to be born ah interesting question so um everybody chooses to be born so um, i remember i thought i was um, supposed to be born on a different day my mom was due on 3 11 and i was born on 3 26 and so i always had this narrative kind of growing up that i um didn't want to come out <laughs> so i decided to stay in and who knows maybe there's some truth to that but we are all we are all um born when we're when we're meant to be born I think that when someone says they weren't supposed to be born, they probably um, haven't figured out exactly why they're here yet, or there may be some confusion with it. 
but um, that would be my my saying. But from every or my my um my thoughts on it. But from everything I've read, everything I've kind of intuited, there I don't think there are mistakes. Um, and there's plenty of places for souls to exit when they there's in fact, in fact there will be many souls that will actually um, get conceived right and then don't go to full term and a lot of times what that is is that there, there's absolutely many many exit points <laughs> when a mother is carrying a baby and some souls kind of incarnate in just to briefly be there and then incarnate out they, they leave the, and the, that would be a miscarriage or something like that or an ectopic pregnancy like I had but um, once the soul stays in the body and is born it's meant to be here for something so um, hopefully that person will be able to figure out why over time but it can be hard it can be hard to find the life meaning and what we're here for but if you have any other questions about that you want to give me more insight into um, to what you're asking um, I can clarify that as well okay all right have a great Wednesday everyone take care and until next time blessed be